All right, uh, let's get started. So, um, my name is Rolf Smeds, and I'm the product owner of the Vardin Design System. And this is the second part of uh, a webinar series we're doing on accessibility. Uh, the first part was, uh, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it focused on accessibility legislation and accessibility standards. And this being the second part, we're going to look into actually uh, building accessible web applications uh, with a focus on botting for obvious reasons. Um, uh, for us, uh, you probably all uh, watching the live stream and the recording can see we're doing this uh, with a live audience at the Vardin office in Turku, Finland. So yeah, there might be some, some noise in the background or some technical hiccups, so please bear with us if that happens. Um, so with that being said, um, I'll start with showing you the agenda. So let's see, like so. So the agenda for this part two is, first of all, I'll try to quickly recap Part, the most important parts uh, of part one. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about uh, the situation with accessibility in the voting platform. Um, we'll then go on to actually look at some ways to ensure that your application is accessible. Uh, and as part of that, I'll also give some voting specific advice for, for uh, how to use voting components in an accessible way. And at the end, we'll have a QA. and a uh, So those watching the live stream can already now uh, type questions uh, into the, um, the question box. Uh, it's probably somewhere on your right. And, and uh, well, the rest of you can just save your questions until the Q&A. So uh, let's start with the recap of part one about accessibility legislation and standards. So first of all, what do we mean by digital accessibility? At its core, it's about ensuring that everybody can access and use your web applications, your websites, your mobile apps, and so on, regardless of whatever disabilities or impairments they may have. Now, those disabilities and impairments can be, for example, blindness or color blindness or just low vision of various kinds. Uh, they can be issues with fine motor control or cognitive issues or a whole bunch of other things, but I think the ones listed here are probably the most relevant for your typical web application. Um, for blind and, and uh, severely vision impaired users, especially, um, there's uh, this thing called screen readers, which is an assistive technology, a piece of software that uh, people who can't properly or at all see the screen uh, use instead to use, well, they use it to use computers in general and mobile phones as well. So a screen reader uses uh, text to speech to translate the contents of the screen to speech, obviously. They read it out loud. Uh, this process is called announcing. So the screen reader announces uh, various parts of the UI. Uh, the user using a screen reader will navigate it typically using the keyboard because it's difficult to use a pointing device if you can't see the pointer. Uh, they also use something called a virtual cursor, which uh, gives the screen reader user a bit more control over uh, how they traverse the page with the keyboard instead of just like the regular focus tabbing that we all uh, are used to. They also provide shortcuts uh, to important parts of the UI. Uh, for example, the navigation, the header, the footer, and so on. Uh, provided that the screen reader software is able to identify those parts. So regarding legislation, um, I highlighted three specific pieces of legislation in part one. First of all, in the US, uh, there's something called Section 508, uh, which uh, concerns public sector bodies, basically services uh, provided by the public sector to citizens. Um, and it also covers private companies if they provide services for the public sector and get uh, public funding. Um, in the EU, uh, we have for years now had uh, something called the Web Accessibility Directive or Directive 2102. Uh, it also covers public sector bodies and 
private companies that provide services for the public sector. So as an example, if we have a private healthcare provider um, that the public healthcare services uh, outsource some of their services to, then that private healthcare provider also needs to comply with the, uh, this directive. And one, in, one important fact to understand that with this directive is that it doesn't only cover the services used by, by citizens and consumers, uh, it also covers the employees of those companies and organizations. On the private side, uh, there is um, an upcoming piece of legislation, or actually this directive already exists. It's called the European Accessibility Act, and uh, it covers uh, a number of uh, private sectors or services provided by private companies, basically, in e-commerce, transportation, and banking. So this directive uh, will be implemented uh, like any EU directive, will need to be implemented by uh, EU member states' international laws. And the deadline that the EU has stated for this is 2025, June 2025, uh, to be precise. So uh, that's exactly three years from now. Uh, something that, thankfully, all these three pieces of legislation have in common are the technical standard that they refer to, uh, that uh, they use to kind of define uh, what you need to do in order to be considered accessible. And that standard is what you see at the bottom of each of these boxes, WCAG 2.0 or 2.1 level AA. WCAG stands for uh, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines and uh, version 2.1 and 2.0 are uh, the most relevant versions at the moment. Uh, it has three priority levels, A, AA and AAA, and AA is the level at which that, that uh, these, uh, this legislation typically points to. So we have WCAG, uh, which essentially um, defines uh, guidelines and a, a large set of criteria that you can use to figure out what you need to do to be accessible and that you can use for testing your, your applications for accessibility. Um, there's also another uh, very commonly refer re referenced uh, piece uh, of, of guidelines uh, known as the ARIA authoring practices. Um, these are not, this is not really a standard per, per se, but it's a set of recommendations and examples of how to actually implement web things in an accessible way. And then finally, we have ARIA attributes, which are HTML features. Um, basically HTML attributes that most of you are probably familiar with uh, that you can use to add semantics uh, to your HTML to make them more understandable to screen readers. So I like to kind of um, summarize these three things as WCAG telling you the what you should aim for and what you should test against. Uh, the ARIA authoring practices uh, are showing you how you should build things that you conform with WCAG, and the ARIA attributes are basically helpers for achieving that. So, that was a recap. Um, let's continue with what the situation currently is with accessibility in the voting platform. So um, a couple of years ago, we actually didn't have a good understanding of, of how accessible our UI features were because we hadn't really conducted a proper accessibility audit. We had tried to build our components with the best intentions and uh, uh, you know, what we thought was a sufficient understanding of WCAG and, and ARIA and so on. Uh, but we weren't really sure. We knew that there were some issues. Uh, so we felt that we didn't really have uh, a good enough expertise in-house at the time to make that assessment ourselves. So we enlisted the help of a company called Tetralogical. Uh, they're experts in accessibility and luckily for us, web components. So they did an extensive accessibility audit of our components uh, based on what in 19 at the time. And um, well, it's the results can't really be condensed into a single number. But if I were to do that, as I have, um, 
you could say that we got a roughly 76% success rate against the set of criteria that they tested our components against. So um, that meant that roughly a quarter of the issues or the criteria that they tested against were actually failing. And uh, many of these failures were actually quite critical. To give some examples uh, of issues that were found at that time and that we have subsequently fixed. Uh, we had buttons that were not correctly announced by screen readers there. Even when you have a, had a button with a clear text label, that wasn't correctly uh, announced. Uh, the same went for, for checkboxes and radio buttons. And there were some issues with form items, uh, not correctly associating their labels with the fields inside of them. There were various issues with uh, val announcing validation errors. Uh, when you had an input field with a clear button and or a required indicator, those were announced as if they were a part of the label. Uh, the menu bar was completely unusable on NVDA, which is one of the top three screen readers out there. And the upload file list had tons of issues of various kinds. Uh, I could go on and on, but I won't because it's embarrassing. Uh, but anyway, we, we ended up fixing uh, a large part of these and especially some of the most, the most of the most critical issues were fixed. And we conducted a second uh, audit uh, for VADIN 23 or the, some alpha version of VADIN 23. And uh, again, if we were to uh, distill the results into a single number, you could say that we got an 84% score this time. So while that doesn't sound like super impressive, um, it, this number doesn't really tell you about the severity of the issue. So as you saw in that list, I just um, uh, showed you there were some pretty serious issues and all of the ones listed and many, many, many more were fixed in VADIN 22 and VADIN 23. So that's, uh, that's the situation with VADIN today. And uh, I guess it's pretty clear to everyone that if you want to ensure that you're building an accessible web application with VADIN, you should definitely upgrade to VADIN 23. Um, but of course, components are only part of the story. There's a lot more that you need to do uh, in order to ensure that your application is actually properly accessible. So uh, first of all, I want to talk about the DOM structure. Uh, DOM stands for Document Object Model, and it's um, basically the model that, or actually, let me put that even simpler, it's the HTML structure, the rendered HTML structure that, you know, goes into the browser or is generated in the browser and is rendered. So the DOM structure is very essential for uh, screen reader support uh, because of because a screen reader isn't really, you know, it's, it's, it's a program, it's a piece of software. It can't actually see and understand the UI as you can. So instead, a screen reader will be just parsing the HTML of the page. And if you think about like how you interpret a UI, that's a very two-dimensional thing. Really. There's vertical things, horizontal things. And when you're looking at a picture of a UI like this, you're not just kind of reading it from one end to the, to the, to the other end, but you're more perceiving it in a very holistic way. So you don't, whereas a screen reader basically uh, can't do that. Instead, it needs to just parse the HTML structure from beginning to end and try to make sense of it. So if you look at this UI here, imagine that you were to read out loud every single element in it. You would have to choose where to begin, and you would have to choose in which order you would read them out. Let's say you're, if you were reading them out to a friend who, who is sitting on the other side of the screen and can't see it, well, you would probably start maybe in the upper left corner and read the Acme ERP application name first, then you would read the navigation, then you would read product dashboard and so on and so on. So hopefully this is the way that the HTML on this page is structured because for example, these three pieces of, of content in the main content area here, those are obviously, uh, I hope, um, obviously to everybody, three columns that contain 
various information. The first column represents orders, the second column represents warehouse, and the third re column represents the factory. So if you were to read this to someone, you would probably read orders and then describe the pie chart and then describe the line chart and then describe the numbers at the bottom. Uh, and hopefully your UI is built in this way that these three columns are three vertical layouts or just three groups of things that are laid out in the HTML structure in the same order and sequence as you can see them. But there's plenty of opportunities to mess this up. Instead of building it this way, what if the developer, for whatever technical reason, decided to do it like this instead? So instead of three columns, we have four rows of content. So imagine you're a screen reader and you just basically have to read uh, the contents of this part of the UI in the order that it's in the HTML. You would have to say orders, warehouse, factory, this kind of pie chart, that kind of pie chart. So all the content that is in the UI would be announced, but it would be announced in a nonsensical order that wouldn't really make any sense. That would be really confusing for the listener to understand anything of. So basically it's very important to ensure that even in the HTML structure, the content of your views, your, your, all your, your UIs uh, is logical if you would read it out loud sequentially from beginning to end. Um, there's another issue in this example you are here that has to do with the order of things. And it's on a more fundamental level in a way. If you look at these three parts of the UI, on the left we have uh, the main navigation. On the right we have the secondary level, uh, second level uh, navigation. And in the center we have this main content area. Maybe the designer decided that they want to have the main content area in the middle because, you know, kind of they like to have it there. So for us who can see the entire UI, this is not much of a problem. It might not be the most conventional layout, having the second level navigation on the opposite side from the main navigation, but it's not super weird. We've all seen this. Um, but for a screen reader, this presents a problem because the screen reader will read it in the order in which it is there. So it will first announce all of the links in the main navigation, then the main uh, content area. And only after traversing the whole main content area will it get to the second level navigation. So it's quite probable that the screen reader user won't even ever know that there is a second level navigation. There are ways to work around this. But the easiest way to ensure that this works well for, for people uh, re relying on uh, screen readers is to make sure that these elements are in the correct order in the HTML structure. Um, another related thing is the focus order. So the order in which you move uh, the keyboard focus from one interactive element to the next. Um, just like I mean, even, even for uh, us, uh, maybe I could, I don't want to say normal users, but users who are, are not relying on assistive technologies, uh, it's very convenient for us that the tabbing order is logical, that uh, the first name comes before last name and then followed by a, in the email address field and so on. Uh, if it jumps back and forth randomly across the form, that would be really annoying to use. And while it's convenient for us for this tabbing order to be logical, it's significantly more important for a screen reader user because again, they're relying entirely on the, on the keyboard. And also for users who are unable to use a pointing device like a mouse. So luckily, if your DOM, your HTML, in other words, is in a logical order, by default, the focusing will also flow in a logical order. It will just follow the order of the HTML structure. Um, there are, of course, ways to override that default order. And sometimes there are good reasons for doing that. But as a rule of thumb, if you notice that your focus is jumping randomly around the page in a way that doesn't really make sense, that's a pretty good indication that probably your DOM structure is not very logical. 
Um, another related thing is uh, UI scalability. And this is, of course, very uh, you know, familiar for anyone who has been building responsive UIs. So UIs that can scale down to a small screen like that of a mobile phone. Uh, now, mobile support itself per se is not necessarily a requirement for, for accessibility, if your especially if your application is not really meant to be used on a phone. Um, but there are still very good reasons to ensure that your UI can scale down to a narrow viewport. First of all, um, users with impaired vision usually use the zip browser zoom feature in browsers that zoom the page contents. And they can actually use zoom levels up to as much as 400%. So everything is four times as, as wide or and, and tall as it would normally be. Now, if you think about it, there isn't really much difference between zooming a page 400% and, and shrinking the window or the viewport down to a quarter of what it would normally be. And that's pretty much the situation you have on a mobile phone because a mobile screen is maybe roughly a quarter of the typical browser window, desktop browser window size. So if you can ensure that your UI scales uh, in a reasonable way down to a narrow layout, which usually means that you know it, all the horizontal structures collapse into a single column, then that also ensures that it will probably work really well with a high browser zoom level. The other benefit of ensuring a scalability uh, like this is that it helps you notice issues with your DOM structure. If, you're, if the UI isn't able to wrap into a single vertical column where all the elements still uh, come in a logical sequence, that's an indication that there are issues with your DOM structure in the order in which your UI elements are, are placed in the HTML. And of course, you know, the added bonus is that, hey, you get mobile support. Right. Next, I want to tell you about semantic UI areas. Semantics are important for screen readers because, well, they can't, May, they can't utilize things like background colors and styling and so on to understand what is what. They need to re rely on programmatically identifiable semantics. Uh, semantics meaning that, well, there's, that the screen reader can understand the meaning and the role of various UI elements. So if you look at the typical web application UI like this, you'll probably identify some typical areas like there's a header at the top, there's a navigation area on the left. There's a main content area in the middle and a footer at the bottom. Well, these are specifically the kinds of areas that you want the screen reader to be aware of because they can then help the user navigate uh, between those, those shortcuts that I told you about. And so luckily, there are actually HTML elements for this. You might never have used them. You might never have seen them, but they exist. So there's a header element that you can use for a header. There's a nav element that you can use for navigation. There's a main element that you can use for your main content area. And there's a footer element that you can use for your footers. So this helps inform the screen reader what is what, instead of everything just being a div, for example. And yes, Flow does have API for using these elements. Um, the nav element has a nav, nav class, the main element has a main class and so on. And you use them just like any other uh, component or, or HTML element in Flow. Now, of course, you might not want to refactor all your divs and your vertical layouts and horizontal layouts and whatnot into these things. Um, so there's a, another, an alternative way of doing the same way of providing these semantics which is, which brings us to the first aria attributes that I want to talk about, which is the role attribute. The role attribute uh, basically does the same thing as these semantic elements. It informs the screen reader what is what basically. So there's, there are uh, role values for navigation, main, and for some reason, banner and content info. Uh, these attribute values are of course up 
designed for for traditional web pages with textual content rather than applications. But as far as I know, they work pretty well for uh, more like application like web UIs as well. Um, the way to apply ARIA attributes in Flow is currently a little bit awkward because you have to go through the Element API. So let's say you have a vertical layout containing your navigation stuff. You could call that nav. And then you would say nav get element set attribute role, which is the name of the attribute, and navigation, which is the value of the attribute. Other semantic things are heading elements, uh, which you probably are familiar with if you've used any HTML at all. H1, H2, H3, H4, H5, and H6. Um, I'm sure many of you have used those simply to get bigger font sizes. That's what I did back in 1996 when I started tinkering with HTML. I'm old. Um, well, the thing is that these are not just visual things. These are actual semantic, some of the first semantic HTML elements. And they are specifically meant to be used for headings of various sections of the UI. So for example, the H1, the level one heading is supposed to be used for the topmost section. For example, uh, the page itself or the entire UI. Maybe that here I've been using it for the application name. And then H2 is the second level heading, which should be, you know, next in line. For example, the name of the page or the view. And H3 I've been using here for uh, the social media accounts, a form subsection, uh, which is, you know, it's basically in the hierarchy of sections in this UI. It's below you, it's be, be inside of user profile, which itself is inside of the application. And yes, Flow has classes uh, for dealing with these as well. We have the H2 class, um, for example, for level two headings. And again, uh, if you don't want to refactor your spans and divs and whatnot to use these for whatever reason, maybe you don't want the uh, styling that is by default associated with them, you can also use ARIA attributes. So if you have a span instead, you can use two ARIA attributes to uh, achieve the same semantics as the H2 element. Uh, first of all, you supply the role, which is heading, and then you supply the level of the heading with the ARIA level attribute and give it a number one to six. And of course, this also means that it's important not to use the heading elements for styling only. If you don't really mean that this is a heading, please don't use these elements. Um, I I did an accessibility test recently, uh, a screen reader test recently on a, on a page, uh, on, a, on an app actually built uh, in-house uh, that used heading elements extensively just to get a nice styling and it was horrible because the screen reader announces each heading as heading level three and then the name of, uh, well, the text of the heading. So it's going to be horrible. And also it messes with the screen readers built in uh, features for providing quick links to different areas of the page. So if, for example, if you want to get bigger font size in, in Flow without doing any CSS, you can use the new uh, Luma utility classes that are introduced in volume 23.1. Uh, actually the utility classes themselves were already introduced in 23.0, but there's now a flow API coming in 23.1, which is tomorrow actually. So um, if you have a span called uh, not a heading, uh, you could add a class name to it and to the class name method, uh, provide the Luma utility dot font size dot extra large. That gives you an extra large font size without messing with the semantics. Uh, next. Uh, next advice is uh, to provide alternatives to gestures and other complex mouse operations. Gestures are, you know, we all use gestures on our phones, uh, and those can be problematic for people with, um, with uh, fine motor control issues. I have a close relative who has Parkinson's disease, and he has trouble unlocking his phone because it requires swiping the screen in a way that is difficult for him. He also has pr trouble answering calls because that also requires a different swipe gesture. 
So swipe gestures can be surprisingly difficult for people who are troubled doing certain movements with their thumbs. Um, there are similar issues with uh, complex mouse operations like drag and drop. In this example here, we have a list that you can reorder by dragging and dropping the rows, which is a fine and efficient way to provide that operation for users who are capable of, of, capable of doing drag and drop operations. But I think we've all been in a situation where uh, some UI has required a drag and drop that has been really tricky, like especially without a mouse, with a trackpad. Those can be tricky. So imagine that you're having trouble with your fine motor control in your hand. That makes it so much more difficult. So a good idea is to always provide an alternate way to do the same thing. So for example, for the reordering of list items, you could provide buttons that can move things around without uh, forcing you to uh, press down the mouse button, do a complex drag, and then let go of the mouse button at the exact right moment. And finally, uh, we have page titles. Um, this seems like a really trivial thing, but uh, and it used to be uh, web pages used to be really good at this, but then things became dynamic, and we got web applications that were in traditional pages and all that. So people started ignoring page titles. Uh, this is really problematic for screen reader users who rely on a screen reader of telling them what they're looking at. If they can't even identify the page that they're on or the view in the application that they're on, that's going to be a problem. So make sure to provide, provide page titles. In Flow, you, use, you, you do this with the page title annotation. And one piece of advice for uh, designing good page titles is to have the most specific thing first, like the name of the page or the name of the view, and then have the least specific thing, like the name of the website or the application last. That way, a screen reader user doesn't have to listen to the whole page title in case it's long, but they can just keep after identifying the exact page they're on. So in summary, uh, use accessible components. So for Vaadin users, that means upgrading to Vaadin 23. Ensuring that the DOM or HTML structure is in a logical sequence. Ensuring that UI scales down to significantly narrower viewports. Ensuring the semantics or trying to provide as good semantics as possible by using semantic elements or RE attributes. And providing alternatives to these gestures and, and, and complex mouse operations. And then finally, page titles. Oh, and one thing I forgot to actually have a slide about, contrast. Uh, obviously, uh, people with low vision can have blurry vision, for example, or can have uh, like bad contrast in their vision. And ensuring that you have sufficient contrast in your UI and sufficient, sufficiently uh, clear um, like differences between different areas uh, visually helps those users actually distinguish things from each other. So those were pretty generic advice that apply regardless of what you're building your web UIs with. Next, I'm going to show you some very volume specific things. Let's start with the app layout. So I guess ideally one might expect the app layout to provide those semantics for the header, the navigation, and the main content area by default. Currently it doesn't, maybe it should, um, but on the other hand, we don't really know if you're going to be using the header for navigation or for something else. So it's kind of up to the developer to specify those uh, semantics at the moment. So you can do that by actually populating those areas with semantic elements or elements with the appropriate ARIA attributes applied. So into the header, you can place a header element. Into the drawer, you can place a nav element. And into the main content area, you can provide a main element. Um, one of the most common issues I would expect to see in any web application is icon-only buttons that don't provide any way for a screen reader to figure out what that button is for. Um, for example, if you have a close button that, that has this typical cross icon, um, the screen reader won't know that that's a cross 
regardless of it's, whether it's a body and icon, an SVG, a PNG, or anything, the screen reader will not be aware of that. And it won't be able to convey that information to the user. The solution is not to try to squeeze an alt, alt attribute, uh, as you might uh, initially think, to the icon itself, but to use the ARIA label attribute on the button itself. So for example, get element, set attribute, ARIA label, and close. Uh, even better to just say close is to provide a bit more context because just saying close does not necessarily provide that information for a screen reader user. Let's say you have, um, oh, by the way, I forgot to say this part. Um, the title attribute that is used to provide a tool tip for any HTML element it seems to be a way to uh, provide an basically invisible or alternative label for the button. You would think so. And you would think that assistive technologies like screen readers would correctly utilize the title attribute and announce that as the name of the button. They don't. I don't know why. Um, but it is the way it is. Um, the title attribute does not provide or does not guarantee accessibility. Anyway. What I was about to say that imagine you have a, uh, a dialogue like this, which has a close button in the upper right corner. Instead of just saying close, which might not necessarily convey to the U screen reader user what it is they're going to close, you could say close dialogue. Because you, know, you can provide as long labels as you like. It's invisible anyway to, to uh, people who are not using a screen reader. So, it doesn't matter how long it is. Be as specific as you feel like being. So close dialogue in this case would be a much better label than just close. Um, by the way, this get element set attribute is a bit tedious. I know we are planning on providing a nicer API, something along the lines of uh, set aria label or something like that in, in a future version of body. But right now, we have to deal with the get element set attribute thing. Right, next up, input fields. Um, please do use the built-in labels in input fields. We have spent a lot of work on ensuring that those are accessible. If for whatever reason uh, you can't do that because there's no space for it or because it looks ugly or you, uh, whatever, um, it's not sufficient to use an icon because an icon again, isn't identifiable for a screen reader. You should also not rely on placeholders because placeholders, uh, the placeholder text that you can put in an empty, show in an empty field, placeholder texts, first of all, are not guaranteed to be correctly announced by screen readers, and they disappear as soon as you type something into the field, at which point that field will become unidentifiable. So what you should do instead is use the same ARIA label attribute and provide an invisible label to the field with that. Um, regarding dialogues, there's a new feature in Vodding 23.1, which is out tomorrow, uh, which adds built-in headers and footers to the dialogue component. Uh, there's all, there are slots in the header and footer for adding your own components. And there's also a built-in title property. So you can do set header title to set the title, and you can set get header and get footer to get access to those footer and header areas. And these already have the appropriate semantics built in, so you don't have to worry about it. OK, so let's say that you've done all this stuff. Can you now be certain that your app is accessible? Unfortunately. No, you still need to do testing. Um, this is just a fact of life with accessibility. There's no getting around it. You need to test things to be sure. Um, and that's what we're going to do in part three of this webinar series. So I'm going to recap parts one and two there somehow quickly. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about some automated accessibility testing tools you can use. Uh, also some of the features that are built into the developer tools in browsers. Uh, I'm going to show you some color contrast checkers online and some utilities for colorblindness simulation 
and we don't yet know when this third part will actually be probably towards the end of the summer because vacation season is coming up but uh you know stay tuned and you will find out so um that was it um now it's we probably have oh yeah we have actually 20 minutes for a q a uh but before we get to that um there's my email address on screen uh you can ask me more questions about accessibility stuff uh that way or through twitter that's my twitter handle uh in our discord chat uh that you can see the url for uh, over there um we have an accessibility channel called a11y that's an abbreviation for accessibility and you can also ask questions there um yeah that's basically it so um i'm going to start with uh the live stream and see if we have any questions there nothing here uh let's see from the beginning could turn that thing on again let's see <laughs> okay um <laughs> a lot of amusing comments here but let's see can you also convert data no i can't okay let's see if there's anything in the question tab okay would you do some demo? Yes, I will be doing a demo in part three. Unfortunately, uh, it's difficult to squeeze that into a 45 minute uh, webinar when you also need to cover a lot of information. So I promise I will be doing uh, lots of actually live demoing things in part three. Um, one issue we're having is we have to navigate to a new top level view. The screen reader should be able to detect that and automatically start reading the new page, but this isn't happening. How can we trigger that? Um, please ask that question again, for example, in the Discord chat or shoot me an email. Uh, I think I need to uh, get a bit more info uh, from you in order to maybe help you with that, hopefully. Okay, um, do we have any um, questions from the live audience? Okay, here's a good question in the in the chat. Do you have accessibility test number for versions before 19? Our enterprise is still running on body eight. Ah, uh, I, I wish I did. Uh, unfortunately, I don't because we never conducted any accessibility tests before body 19. Uh, but as I think it's pretty obvious from uh, what I told you about VAD in uh, 19, there are a lot of significant issues there that um, are, of course, also present in older versions from VAD in 10 onward. For VAD in 8, that's a completely different framework, completely differently implemented component. So I honestly don't know because we haven't really, we, we never really did a proper conduct, uh, um, assessment of accessibility on VAD in 8 or 7. Please provide a demo for a cross-platform device like mobile and tablet application. Yeah, I will. I will try to do that as well next time regarding accessibility. Kind of want to learn more about Aria. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think it's pretty easy to find uh, information on both WCAG, WCAG standard, and and the Aria attributes. Uh, you just Google WCAG. And that should be the first hit. And if you Google ARIA attributes, that should take you to the why ARIA page um, shouldn't be a huge issue. Um, yes, the recording, there is a recording if you, have, um, if you have registered for this webinar, which you probably have since you're viewing it live. Um, I think you should also be able to follow that same link to get to a live record, uh, to, re to recording. Of, of the webinar later on. Um, if you have any trouble finding that, just shoot me an email or ask in the VAD in Discord chat. There's a question here, what issues still exist uh, just with VAD in 23? Well, there's a whole bunch of them, uh, but luckily uh, they're mostly not that severe. Uh, I would say that um, some of the most typical issues we still have in, with components in VAD in 23 have to do with mobile screen readers.
Uh, so if you use a screen reader, for example, voiceover on Safari on, on iOS, uh, then there are a lot of, well, there are a number of rather severe issues there that we're still uh, working on. 84% uh, is not 100%. That's absolutely true. Um, but I also want to point out that there are very few websites or applications out there that reach 100% or anything anywhere near 100%. Um, distilling this down to a number is, is maybe not that good of an idea, but it's a bit too complex to explain in a, much, a lot more detail. Um, much more important than the exact percentage is how severe those remaining issues are. And luckily, except for the mobile screen readers, uh, I can say that the issues remaining in Vodin 23 are not very severe for the most part. Preparing the test session, can you please add some suggestions about how to correctly use a screen reader for testing, which and how? Yes, that is exactly what I will be doing in part three, although I will be focusing mainly on voiceover on Mac uh, because I have a Mac and it's kind of awkward to use. Well, I would need to use a uh, uh, you know, virtual machine to use any Windows-based voice uh, screen readers like NVDA and JAWS. So I'm going to be focusing on, on a voiceover, but luckily, except for differences between uh, in, in keyboard shortcuts, uh, all screen readers work very similarly. So I'm going to be showing live how to, how to do testing with them uh, in part three. And there are some questions here about uh, webinars and other topics. And well, uh, yes, we're going to have webinars on other topics as well. Uh, if you want to suggest some particular topic, you could, for example, go to our Discord chat and make those suggestions there, and I'm sure somebody will, will make a note of that. I have a follow-up question about the 84%. Yeah. Can my application still reach 100% even though the framework is not? Yeah, good question. So can your application reach 100% weak and compliance? Uh, even if you're using components that are only 84%, so to speak, accessible. Um, yes, technically, yes. If that's something that you want to strive for, um, you, can, you can avoid using component, those components that have more issues, for example. Uh, you can avoid using certain, uh, certain features in, in components that have issues. Uh, you can avoid uh, combining components and features in ways that have issues. So uh, technically, if you really want to strive for 100%, you can do that. Um, but as I at least tried to convey in part one, uh, striving, striving for 100%, uh, a 100% perfect WCAG score is not really a meaningful thing to even do. That shouldn't be your goal. Your goal should be to ensure that people with low vision, with uh, motor, fine motor skill issues, and with color blindness, and people who use screen readers can use your UI. It's not about getting a perfect score on a particular standard, even if that happens to be the standard that the laws point to. Ultimately, you will be fine if you just do your best to make sure that uh, you're actually providing a usable UI for people with disabilities, even if your WCAG score was 40%, as long as people can use your product, you'll be fine. So the WCAG uh, scores, especially if you use an automated testing tool, that will only give you a vague approximation of your level of accessibility, and that should never be uh, like your, your only target. So numbers are good in, like, they're a good indication, but they don't really tell you the full picture of how good or bad you are. Um, I could show you an example. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't fit into the, uh, into the schedule here, but I could show you an example of uh, a web page that is completely inaccessible, 
uh, but I guess a perfect score on automated weak act tests. So yeah, good question, but I think my, my best advice is don't get caught up on the numbers, but look instead at what are the actual issues and how severe are they? Are they actually preventing someone from using the site and do testing with screen readers because that's really the only way to be sure. If your UI is 84% of 100, then you should remember to add an accessibility statement in your app. It's always good to provide an accessibility statement. If your app is 100 or 10 or whatever percentage, it's always good to provide an accessibility statement. Um, of course, if you know that your app doesn't work with mobile screen readers, for example, or doesn't work with NVDA or JAWS or VoiceOver, or a particular combination of NVDA and Chrome or whatever it may be, uh, then you should probably state that in your accessibility statement and say, unfortunately, there are some issues with NVDA on Chrome on Android or whatever. And, uh, you know, um, that way people who rely on assistive technologies can maybe choose another browser or another screen reader uh, to use your site or, or app instead. So that's always, that's always a good approach. A yes. Where should the statement be placed? Where should the statement be placed? Um, good question. Um, presumably, well, I think a typical place to have it would be in the footer. And if you've marked your footer in a semantic way that the screen reader can find it easily uh, and ensure that at least that part is accessible. <laughs> Then, then you should then you should be able to find it. It could be in the header as well, but I think it's typically in the footer. Uh, it's it's of course why uh, the footer is is in, Aria calls the footer uh, the content info area, and that says a lot about what they expect you to use it for. So uh, uh, the accessibility statement would be info on your content. So it would make sense to put a link to the accessibility statement there, in my opinion. So with the uh, So yeah, okay. So so I'm repeating the question so that the people in the stream can hear it as well. So would that be the like the last and only thing that Voiceover, for example, manages to read if that's the only part that is accessible? I mean, theoretically, I suppose yes. Uh, if if that happens to be the only accessible part of your UI, then it's good that if, if at least that part is accessible. Uh, but I it's I, I wouldn't expect the situation to be that bad. Um, but uh, as I'm going to show in part three, screen reader, readers provide these shortcuts to different uh, important areas. These important areas are called landmark areas. And uh, so think about, think of them as landmarks. The footer is a landmark that is easy to spot because it's listed in the landmark list that the screen reader provides for you. So uh, if, you're, if you're, you're looking specifically for, you, you, let's say you're, you're tr you try to use a website and you notice that it's not working very well with your screen reader, then you, you should at least be able to jump to the footer, which is where you would expect to find the accessibility, uh, link to the accessibility statement and Thanks to that, thanks to that a shortcut the screen, that the screen reader can provide to it if it's semantically encoded. And um, well, then at least you would find the accessibility statement and find out that, oh, it doesn't work with Safari, let's go to Chrome instead. So um, I think good intentions are much more important than numbers. That's maybe one of my most important takeaways here. It doesn't do uh, a blind person any good if that you have a 100% score on a weak hack test if they still can't use your site. Uh, okay, some more questions. We have a few more minutes for questions, uh, unless I'm, I'm, I'm mistaken. Yeah, I think we do. Uh, let's see. Uh, are there already acceptances for this from the government or have you already made experiences here in any country? Well, um, if you watch part one of, uh, of the webinar, 
um, I'm trying to outline uh, the accessibility legislation in the US and in the EU. And the problem is that none of those are particularly precise about what you need to do to be accessible. They point to WCAG, but they don't really tell you that you, you, none of the laws say that you need to have a 100% score on WCAG. That's not a thing. That's not what you're tested against. What you're tested against, if somebody complains that your site or app is not accessible, you're not tested against a score on a particular testing tool. You're tested against actual accessibility. So you're tested against whether or not, for example, uh, your site works with at least some screen readers. So laws don't really refer to any particular numbers. The spirit of those laws is that you need to do your best to be accessible, not that you need to get a perfect score on something, for example. Uh, yeah, uh, there's a good advice here. Try to get in contact with a disabled person or a disability society. They can help with accessibility testing and give pointers for what to look for. Absolutely. Um, um, I know from experience that it's super difficult to get a good understanding of, for example, how well uh, a site supports a screen reader if you're not used to using screen readers. As you'll see in part three, uh, browsing a website with a screen reader is a totally different world from browsing it visually. Uh, it's a jarring experience, to be honest. Uh, and it's really difficult to determine as a novice whether or not that experience is on par with, with what people would expect. So having a person with that who is a native uh, screen reader user, for example, is immensely useful uh, compared to if you just try to do it yourself. Um, there's a question here about Vodin Pro components. Are Vodin Pro components accessible? Yes, they are. They were included in the accessibility audit that we did. And uh, they were all, they are also included in, uh, in the project we have, the ongoing project that we have where we are fixing the accessibility issues. And in case that wasn't clear when I uh, talked about the state of accessibility in voting components, even though we have now done a huge amount of work to get things significantly better in voting 23, that doesn't mean that we have stopped working on accessibility. We're continuously working on fixing more and more accessibility issues. And we're going to be shipping those fixes in minor versions of Vodin 23. So if you're on Vodin 23, as long as you keep upgrading to the minor versions, you will get those fixes into your app as well. Um, I, maybe I should also mention that uh, the accessibility uh, work that we're doing does not cover third-party add-ons or anything that you will, anything uh, that is not part of the Vodin design system. So uh, including Vodin component factory add-ons and, and third-party add-ons, those are not covered. So I can't make any guarantees uh, about those at all. Right. We seem to be out of questions online and pretty much out of time. So unless we have one more question from the audience live here, I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you for listening and uh, stay tuned for part three if you're interested in accessibility testing.